go whenever you're ready. You're ready? Okay. So, my name's Chad. Thank you very much, Hansel, for having me over here to, ch to talk to you all about modal AI. I will try <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I'll tell you a bit about about the company to, to get started. We uh, we're about six months old now. Uh, a number of us uh, spun out the effort that was a project inside of Qualcomm Research that was whose main purpose was bringing Snapdragon into the robotics market, and so. What robotics meant were aerial and ground robots, or drones and roving, <clears throat> roving robots, and some of the work that we did there. Well, well, we'll get into that. So we we left. Uh, Qualcomm was really, really generous and gave us everything in the lab, or everything that we thought was interesting and valuable in the lab. They gave us a license to the technology. They handed off um, a bunch of customers and. And then also Qualcomm ended up being, I think, technically our first customer. <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. good. That was good too. So, so you'll see a lot in this presentation uh, between what we're doing at Modal AI today. It all builds upon what we were doing at Qualcomm. So we're really trying to take the work that we did and build a product out of it. And I would say, uh-oh. All right, good. My wife's IMs don't show up on the main. <laughs> uh, the uh, so, you know what we found is that uh, everything we thought we were doing right at Qualcomm seems to have been validated in the or seems to be validated in the market outside. It seems the robotics industry is taking off, drones are taking off, and there's a lot of interest. Yeah. So is Qualcomm getting out of that? Is that no? Is thanks. That's a great question, and feel free to ask questions at any time. No, Qualcomm's still selling chips. Right. into the robotics right. space, right. but sure. in terms of kind of advancing the state of the art, and well, I can't really, now it's, my information's six months old, so feel free to correct me, but if anybody in here, the, they're, they're kind of not advancing on the algorithmic side in robotics like we were before. So before we were doing a lot on the algorithmic side in robotics, and now they're really just focusing on the chipset side. So it's a very good question, because I don't mean to imply that they're getting out. In fact, we're a customer of Qualcomm's chipsets. So uh, in fact, you know, we hope to help them, and I expect that we'll help them uh, actually keep going on that in the future the, as, a, as a separate company. And it, you know, from my perspective, on the, on the business side, which we'll talk mostly technology, because the business is kind of boring. But, or, well, I don't know, maybe you think it's exciting. But, <laughs> the uh, on the business side, actually, right now is a really, really good time for a lot of robotics uh, activity. It's, there's a ton going on. It's just not maybe in the millions and millions and millions of things that would justify having a large R and D group. So that would be. Uh, but I don't want to speak to that today. I only know where we were six months ago, and uh, little has changed. Little has changed. All right. <laughs> so, but. Last slide on business, last topic on business. We do, this is, robotics is a big opportunity. Uh, robot AI, and really what modal AI focuses on in terms of the AI aspect is AI for movement as opposed to necessarily AI for perception, even though that's a big part of what we're doing. We're really applying perception towards movement and autonomous navigation. And this is, these are numbers consolidated out of a, a bunch of different market research reports, but you know, it's, it paints the classic, hey, there's a really big number out there. And this seems to be the case. There's a lot of very interesting things going on to justify, to justify this. Drones, you know, I think we've kind of plateaued on what drones can do for aerial photography. And that seems to be a nice, interesting market. But the, now it's rolling over into what can you do for utility. And there's a, a ton of use cases and there's a lot of groups really taking advantage of what drones can do specifically to you know move their their business forward whether it's for business or inspection and 
and, and so forth. Whether yeah, some interesting things are indoors and outdoors, aerial surveillance, warehouse inspection, security. Uh, and there's a lot of folks looking to get into that or actually building products around that today. And so, this actually is a slightly older concept for what we're building, but we're taking we're, we're taking what we did for what was Snapdragon Flight, which was built around an older chipset. We're taking that and uh, let me start, uh, taking that and uh, we had done a lot of work on the 820 at Qualcomm, and we're advancing that. We built an eight, Snapdragon 820 platform inside of Qualcomm to replace the Snapdragon flight, and then we're taking that and building out a much more robust navigation stack and capability around that platform. And we'll talk uh, a bit about the types of uh, specifics we're getting into, but we're adding time of flight, or we've got a time of flight sensor built in. We're actually, for indoor depth mapping, we've got stereo, we're looking to do color stereo, it's 720p for outdoor navigation. Merge the two, indoor, outdoor, uh, full sensor kit for aerial and ground robotics. And as a company, that'll go through the, the full stack. So I'll show you in a bit what, what that means, but we've got the capability of uh, designing hardware, software, and uh, full robotic systems to go tackle these, these tasks. And the, the, the team is, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're capitalizing a lot of the work. So before, so for my, my personal history, I spent about five years on robotics. I was actually the first person to work on robotics at Qualcomm when uh, we were trying to tackle biologically inspired neural networks for robotics. It turned out to be very ambitious, as it, it kind of sounds ambitious, it was ambitious. And, Let's say we'll, the future will decide whether that's actually a possibility or not. <laughs> but we morphed uh, over those five years into Snapdragon for robotics, which, which turned out to be, I think, obviously I'm kind of betting my whole future on it, but I think is a very interesting, uh, very interesting opportunity in technology. And prior to that, I was uh, the software lead on computer vision R and D, and we'll get into the team uh, later. But we've got uh, you know a number of ex years experience actually bringing these types of things to market. And here's, uh, here's some examples. So I see some of you are, some of you should know these, uh, or hopefully know these, but we've got, uh, on the work we did at Qualcomm, there were actually a number of interesting products deployed. The most exciting one is, this is the Mars helicopter. So this is a helicopter that's gonna fly on Mars. It's gonna be launched in 2020. This one uh, is very, very exciting. It has the, original Snapdragon flight board inside of it to do the computer vision and navigation processing on Mars for navigation. So this is, there's kids toys that where you kind of pull and, and spin and the, and the single propeller spins really fast and allows the thing to take off. That's basically what they've designed because the atmosphere is only 1% of the atmosphere here. So it's got these uh, coaxial rotors, two rotors that spin really, really fast. It takes off like a a spinning top, spinning propeller top, flies for about 90 seconds, and then comes back down and it's spent all of its battery <laughs> in, in 90 seconds, trying to just get up into the air, go around for a second, you know, 90 seconds and come back down. But that should be very exciting to see happen. But there's a number of, number of different things that, uh, that went on. This, I think, was the biggest commercial success, something called a hover cam. This one's the Sony Ibo that used the Snapdragon 820, and that's still out today, actually. And so there was a robot snake even somebody built out of the system. I don't know what happened to that, but it's a cool, it's a, it was a cool concept at least. And so here's the architecture around the platform that uh, we designed and built at Qualcomm and tested and actually, so we're trying to bring that to market. The, the, so if, since, this slide was done at Qualcomm, it's a Snapdragon-centric world. But uh, what, what we have are four cameras that go in. Right now we're actually, so there's, there's four cameras on the input. In the future, what, 
One's for tracking. We have two here for, as a stereo pair for depth from depth from stereo. One high res 4K video sensor. These so as we evolve this platform, what we're looking to do is one tracking sensor, two 720p stereo sensors, at, which will do color and can be used for high resolution video, and then one time of flight tracking sensor to have a full indoor outdoor perception system running concurrently. We've got a nice CPU with a uh, a large GPU, a computer vision, DSP, a DSP on board the silicon that's uh, capable of running flight control with direct access to all the I.O. for real, uh, real time I.O. processing. This is what something we're calling voxel cam. This is using that conv camera configuration you just saw, but we're evolving this uh, as we speak. Uh, literally to, to move towards the camera configuration we just talked about, which the idea for this is, uh, we refer to it as a GoPro for robots. It's, you think of a GoPro and how you can mount that on anything and then go capture the world. We want to make the equivalent for robots where you have this little module, it's about this big, and you can mount it on any robot. It'll fly, drive, autonomously navigate your, your robot. And so we think that's, we think it's pretty interesting. There's a lot of interest, at least in the technology and generally in what we're, what we're putting together. But what we'd like to do is uh, bring it to market in some kind of self-contained form. Excuse me, Chad? Yes. If that was like a module that someone could buy and just add it to their own robot kit, what sort of connector would it use? Would it be HDMI or USB 3.0 or? Great question. So kind of coming back, <laughs> let's see, does this illustrate that well enough? Maybe. I mean, uh, this is an eye chart, but we're kind of getting back into what you're, it's a little bit difficult, but we've got uh, UARTs and I2Cs, USB. It would not be HDMI, but whether it's UART or SPI or USB would all be reasonable approaches. Okay. And now, one of the things that this brings with it that we have found uh, just a ton of interest for is LTE. As we talk about drones and the utility of drones kind of coming online and people finding ways to make use of drones, LTE is absolutely critical. So folks are looking to get beyond line of sight. Folks are approved to do beyond line of sight with one of the partners. Are, is anybody, are fami folks familiar with the FAA's IPP program, the Immigration <coughs> Pilot Program? I thought they only allowed line of sight control. No. Someone on the ground. So the IPP program is uh, where 10 municipalities throughout the country have been approved to start evolving businesses beyond line of sight. And so Modal AI is actually a part of the IPP program. Uh, we're an official partner of the San Diego. So San Diego won uh, the rights to be a part of that. And so we were actually flying uh, within the last month beyond visual line of sight with full in fact, there were representatives from the city there and everything, and, and everybody's very excited. But to do that, uh, the partner we were with at the time, they had an antenna that was at least as tall as this ceiling, actually probably one and a half times the height of the ceiling, to try and get coverage with the vehicle as it was flying. And you were using LTE? No, not yet. Oh. So, but that's, nobody wants to be <laughs> carrying around giant antennas and whole power systems and everything when you can you can effectively replace it with something this big and do and put LTE on the vehicle and, uh, and have uh, AT&T connectivity and so that was a, one of the efforts we did at, at, at Qualcomm was to, to study that study how study the coverage of uh, subcellular networks at 400 feet and then we provided a white paper or wrote a white paper and provided that to the FAA and the FCC and really what it showed was your coverage is too good. You go up and you see all the cell towers in the city. Wow. <laughs> so when you start to broadcast, especially at high data rates, you're actually kind of damaging the, the, the capacity on the ground. And so we provided some suggestions for how to mitigate that. And actually we know of one carrier who's actually deployed those recommendations. Mm -hmm. And then we did that was one of the things that we've done as modal AI as well as help to validate some of those that some of those work. 
Uh, mm -hmm. As part of this IPP program, we were, were allowed to fly. We flew down at the border to uh, do some testing there with uh, LTE coverage. So that was a little bit surprising because with the, the Qualcomm view of the world where, you know, well, basically these are not large chipset sales. They're like sales of 10 or something like that into the LTE space. But for a standalone company, it's very, very interesting. Uh, it's a nice nice opportunity and it's coming, right? It's just gonna take a while to get going, but we're at the point right now where where these businesses are, are looking, or not, I mean, they're, they're doing it. They're not looking, they're designing systems right now around LTE, designing aerial or drone systems around LTE and bringing, and they wanna bring those to market quickly within the next 18 to 24 months. So it's a very exciting time. Uh, for, for a lot of this technology. Now, the, so the software stack is, is Linux based. We're trying to get as open as possible. Uh, that's our, that's our, our goal, kind of build a platform, build a very sophisticated platform and make it as open for development and other roboticists as we possibly can. So this is uh, back to, you know, a software stack, but the, we're built on ROS and on Linux, and we have access. Uh, we can program two of the G, or two of the DSPs are programmable. One of the GPUs is programmable, and we have all that out validated, and we're bringing that online. And so, the applications for indoor navigation, follow me, and those sorts of things uh, can come on, and you can build uh, build robots that go go do these. Yeah. How, how much of the higher level raw stack are you using, like navigation, stuff like that, if any? We have, so we use, let's see, let me think about that, think it through. We use, leverage the ROS communications portion a lot. Yep. We leverage the offline tools a lot. I don't think we use currently the navigation stack for ROS at all. I'm trying to think that through. We may leverage parts of that in the future, but but yeah, it's mostly, we mostly use the communications and com interoperability, the, com the communications inter and interoperability and the tools around it, especially like our biz and stuff like that are, are really <coughs> useful. So, so here's one of the, the, one of the projects that Modal AI is working on, we're presented a problem there's a problem presented earlier this year. Folks are kind of keep track of what goes on in the, in the drone business. The, the DOD grounded DJI drones over security concerns. <coughs> and they had found, back to the topic of utility and how, what people are finding very useful about these, about aerial robotics is uh, for surveillance or short range reconnaissance. So soldiers, in the field or deployed in the field are using these to go do forward reconnaissance, look over a hill, look into a village or, you know, whatever you're, whatever, you know, fly this thing before you go, uh, fly before you try. Uh, and they were using them all over the place and a lot, but as a published feature, DJI collects all of your telemetry and video and puts it on their servers. And you would imagine if you're, a, if you're, a, you know, concerned about security, having all of your assets, information about where they are and everything on a server and, you know, a foreign server doesn't look very good. So they grounded, or doesn't, is not a very good idea. So they grounded all the DJI drones and then they ran into this problem where DJI has 96% of the market share in the, in the, in the world. So they couldn't, they didn't really have an opportunity, they didn't have any way to replace it. And DJI makes a really, really nice product, and I understand why they've done so well, and I understand why they were using them all throughout the Army, but this gave them a really big problem because they couldn't, they didn't have a way to replace it. So they, DOD, uh, around the same time we were forming this new company, uh, put out a, re a request for uh, ideas and proposals to help do that, and we'll, we'll issue a press release here soon enough. It's, uh, we're small, so like you, 
there's no press release person. You just have to do it yourself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but we are, we will, so this will be public at some point, and we're allowed to share this. But we were awarded a, a nice size contract from a group called DIU, which is the Defense Innovation Unit, which is the DOD seed fund, um, to go, we're basically tasked with going to build autopilot and communications hardware for the DOD's future use cases. Now, so I'll tell you about, about what we're building. First, leverage is the stuff we did at Qualcomm, which we went in and do a bit of detail about, but we're combining it, and this isn't clear because this comes right out of the design for the thing that we're working on for the DOD, but we've got, um, it's really four main, four subsystems. The main subsystem built around the Snapdragon 820, the flight subsystem uh, built around an MCU, and a comm subsystem built around LTE. And there's also a payload subsystem which is getting merged into the comm system to handle uh, and the payloads being different kinds of cameras. Uh, so we're gonna support a bunch of different like FLIR style cameras and so forth and plug those in to the to the module. And so effectively you can imagine an autopilot system that the DOD can build a bunch of different bunch of different drones out of and, and go use. And we're gonna try and make this as small as possible. This will be interesting because I'll have two different flight controllers running independently. There'll be one internal to the Snapdragon running and one external, and we've got to figure out how to make sure one's a failover to the other, which is not really that easy of a task. I think, like on a piece of paper, it's like, oh, you, have, you shall have a failover a flight control system, and then when you actually have to go build it, it's like not as simple as a bullet point on a, on a, on a form, but that's okay. The hard problems, uh, we're here to do the hard problems. So, so we could end up actually supporting actually more than five or more cameras. We'll have the stereo cameras, we'll have a tracking camera, we'll have the legacy high resolution camera, and then we'll have a USB camera and potentially HDMI and LVDS style cameras in the future all coming in, uh, depending on what the application is. But you can imagine thermal imaging and other things kind of being an interesting, interesting use cases for these. So, <clears throat> so that uh, we're calling Voxel Plus. Names, of course, subject to change because there's really nothing binding us to them. But we like the idea, we like the name Voxel. And the second half of what we're doing is is interesting. We're we're going to build a portable LTE base station to control all of these things. The idea is building effectively a base station that looks like this that can control multiple vehicles concurrently. And to do that, we're taking a household femto cell or small cell and repackaging it as a controller, doing that in the DOD spectrum to control multiple vehicles. And that's pretty exciting. We'll see if we can pull it off. It's not, it's not as, the previous one, the autopilot is a slam dunk. We've done that, this will be our, we've done that a number of times. Uh, <laughs> we've done the number of times over and the team's done that a number of times, but the Ground controller will be a, a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of an R&D, uh, an R&D effort. So it's nice that the DOD is funding a new R&D project because we came from an R&D group. So we get to continue on in that spirit, but there's definitely, there's definitely a little bit of uncertainty there, but that's okay. It should be a, a nice challenge that we certainly wouldn't have taken on if we didn't think we could do it. But to walk through this diagram a bit, you know, we'll have a drone. This uses that autopilot we talked about before with the comms subsystem. Communicate over LTE. We're going to bundle what's referred to as a small cell or a femto cell in a, in a, in a controller uh, backhaul simulator or a backhaul stub uh, into, a, into a box that big. And then Toga is the Army's tablet. It's like a tough book, a bulletproof tough book. And then, uh, you know, the they all really want to just use their smartphones to control the vehicles. So, <laughs> from a timeline, the this is probably a conservative timeline, but you know you don't want to commit too aggressively. But basically, we think you know within six months we should have mod, uh, modules available for early access to partners, and then in the fall more of a wider beta availability, and by the winter 
of next year, within a year from now, we should have commercial availability of, of the technology that we're talking about, either Voxel Cam or Voxel Plus. And then, and then we'll have, we'll show you some of the drones that we're working on, and then hopefully, you know, in 18 months, we've got Gen 2 underway, and we've got line of sight on how we're actually gonna achieve that. So, a uh, lot of good stuff. That but it's, with going so fast, how do you prevent a, uh, a DJI security concern? Oh, what a great question. The, so the question was, how do we prevent a security concern on our end? So back to the open platform. We're building an open platform for the DOD and its partners to actually build a product around. And the, they are very into open source. They want everything open. They want to build everything from scratch as much as humanly possible is so that they can have full control. There are uh, security requirements. We were talking about that today and how to address some of them. The Snapdragon processor, like it's basically the same thing in your, in your, uh, in your smartphone or in an Android smartphone. It supports secure boot, so encrypted boot that doesn't allow you to uh, hack it, at least in theory. There's always ways around these things. But that being said, it's much more secure. It makes it much more difficult than, than what would be there today without any modification. But yeah, there's, there's thoughts we might put a security chip out there that you can, is a hard chip that you can run code through to get it encrypted and come back, maybe for establishing the comms link or validating, validating that you're, uh, you're who you say you are, those kinds of things. But yeah, there's, there's real thoughts around that. But starting with an open platform is the base. That's actually what they consider to be the most important thing because they want to build it. They want to be able to build this, you know, build it and ship it and get it and, and validate it and, and know what they're, what they're work, working with. And, and it's probably fair to say you're inheriting the security built into LTE, which DJI was not able to do because they're just on a Wi-Fi network, right, or something comparable to that. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, well, yeah, the DJI's big problem is that they were just hosting your videos and flight maps yeah. on their wow. servers and they're partially owned by the Chinese government and so that's just uh, it's just a big problem um, the and then also they I don't know if you looked into it but there's been they've had two just total uh, misses they checked in the github like open source their s3 keys so that not only did DJI have all the video, everybody in the world had the video who looked at their source code on GitHub. <laughs> and uh, there were a couple of things like that. And so, but still, you know, there's interesting problems. Like what if somebody sneaks in and puts an SD card in the drone that reboots and it reimages and it looks right for everything except for the little code that goes and, send, you know, sends out information. So there's, you know, the, at some point, all this will have to be hacker-proof, but some of that falls really falls into building an open platform, so that you know, in theory, those guys could just reimage the drone before every flight, or you know, or whatever it is. I mean, you know, along those lines, uh, to try and to prevent some of that stuff. Yeah, I just read the other day, and I looked it up to verify that LTE was again hacked. Oh, well, yeah, there, everything's hackable. Yeah, yeah this is. Uh, so you're just saying it's harder to hack? Is that the point? Probably just responding to whoever. Yeah, it is definitely harder to hack than Wi-Fi. You effectively would have to know exactly what was going on and then build a replica system, which, you know, is, is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can build it once, you can generally build it again. Um, but there's, yeah, we're discussing additional layers of encryption on top of that, uh, authentication encryption. But nothing's totally... Nothing's totally foolproof, <laughs> but you keep making it harder and harder. It's security by uh, ever-increasing difficulty. And, and, but it is a foundation on building. It is about building an open platform that allows others to evolve on it. Evolve it. Oh, let's see. All right, so one of the other customers we're working with uh, we're actually building a complete drone. <laughs> and these folks want to actually compete with DJI in some way, shape, or form. And so what I've got here, this is going to be announced at CES, launched at CES. I'm going to show you a couple uh, 
a couple of the vi videos of a prototype. You won't get a good, you won't be able to see too much of what's going on, but this is a prototype for what? Okay, here is a test. Oh, I'm sorry. Double volume. Uh, that's Rich, if you guys remember Rich. Oh. He's back. Yeah. <laughs> He's back. He's back. So we're going to show oops, visual obstacle avoidance here. So our pilot, Donald, he's trying to fly the drone into the wall. Uh, you should see, if you can kind of tell the light goes red and then it detects an obstacle and doesn't, doesn't fly forward. So this, what's nice about this drone that we're building, or what's, what stands out about this drone, is it's a fully autonomous drone, has obstacle avoidance, GPS denied navigation, has GPS, but it's a 209 millimeter diagonal drone. So it's about this big. This is 230, 230 millimeters. So it's you know 10% smaller than this, but it has a 24 and a half minute flight time. So we've uh, we've spent a, a bunch of time with this one specifically optimizing for flight time. It's effectively a flying battery. It's got three 18650 cells in there, like the same cells that are in a Tesla, uh, you know, mounted in there, and then. Yeah, actually, you can see this has got the prototype battery pack on the bottom. You can actually just see it hanging there on, on it. And then, uh, but so we've had a lot of fun trying to evolve that. It's got five inch props. The thing should move move quickly while flying for for a long period of time, relatively. If you twenty minutes, once you get above twenty minutes in the drone space, that's that's pretty challenging enough. And this one's really small to do that. We think it'll be the smallest out there that's able to do that. Certainly with obstacles so forth so and then I'll show you a little bit of the you know, preview of what we're actually building then for the booth is it playing sometimes you have to come over here click yeah Maybe? oh shoot I don't have it blown up sorry about that but what you'll see is this is going to go and fly a figure eight pattern in the lab. And uh, is there a reason why you put the wallpaper up on the? <laughs> or was it just happened to be that way? Uh, that was the wallpaper we had at the lab at Qualcomm that we <laughs> we took with us. It's like, you guys just like looking like that. We took the walls with. Yeah, we took the walls with us. Uh, now it is interesting for obstacle avoidance. You know, for the stereo cameras. You need texture on the walls, like a white wall it won't recognize very well. So it helps with that. And I think orig originally, actually, I'll show you a video. I think I have a video in here. This, that, those, those walls came up from our CES, our 2016, January of 2016 CES demo. And we took those with us from the booth and mounted them in the lab. And then I guess we're very partial to those walls because <laughs> they came with us. Uh, they came with us in this lab. Um, yeah, isn't that funny? I didn't even know. I'm, just, I'm like so used to. I didn't even notice it. Um, okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Good. So, this is what we built. Now this is two years. Oh, is it almost three years old? That's coming yeah. out, I believe. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. January, <laughs> January of 2016. So now I'll cheat and show back some of the work that we did at Qualcomm. But. Uh, same walls, this was in a booth in South Hall too at CES. Uh, so what you'll see here on the top left is the first person view on the camera from the drone. Bottom left is the third person view uh, of a camera that was sitting in the corner. And this was what was going on inside of the drone on, on target. And what we're doing here is the vehicle's flying, it's, got, it's using uh, uh, technology called uh, visual inertial odometry to, to, to generate its location. Takes its location, has a depth map. In this case, the depth map was actually coming from stereo cameras. And that depth map, you, you combine it with the location, you project that out, and you can create what are referred to as voxels or 3D volumetric representations of the world. It looks like a Minecraft map. I think in this demonstration, there were eight centimeter cube. Uh, when we use a, an active depth sensor or a time of flight depth sensor, we can bring these down to more like five centimeters cubed. But so then the vehicle now has a map of its environment inside its memory, and we told it to come home, and it generated a path. Um, you generated a path 
to come home, and then it follows the path autonomously. So this is an unstructured obstacle avoidance autonomous navigation demonstration. So this was, you know, in essence, the vehicle and the computing and the navigation system did not know about this environment when it started the demonstration. It built the map and then navigated it autonomously. And this, to the ROS question, obviously this is our viz, and we were leveraging ROS for all the communication, um, all the communication between the different modules, between localization and mapping and path planning and the flight controller. But you're doing all your own algorithms for like the motion planning and... That's right, yeah, these were all algorithms we developed at Qualcomm. Actually, motion planning, we were using OMPL, okay. the Open Motion Planning Library. Uh, but how we, all the other vision stuff and the flight control was all done at Qualcomm and then we had to reformat it into OMPL and then reformat it back out into Ross World. So here's the exact same demo just to show that we aren't doing only drones. This was the exact same demo done on the first floor of the QRC building, Qualcomm QRC building, which is like across the street. <laughs> and so this was the, this was a ground rover called the Snapdragon rover at the time. We have them now in our lab too, along with the wallpaper. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think that we still call them the Snapdragon rover stuff. So. And, and so here we, we're setting waypoints or destination points way out in the distance in the, in the robots navigating using that exact same technology that uh, was demonstrated the year prior at CES. This was probably about a year, year and a half later. Uh, so it's, it, it, it advanced some, uh, it certainly gotten a lot more robust, but it advanced some in terms of mapping. The gray, the gray scale map was loaded a priori and then the colored map was done dynamically as the robot moved. So this would, the grayscale map gave some kind of constraint of the world to plant waypoints in, and then it would figure out here it sees this door. It actually makes it look like it notices the person coming down the hall and waits. That's not what's going on. It got jammed up at the door, and it happened to be like coincidentally somebody started coming through. But it makes it look really cool. Like it <laughs> was it unsure of whether that was a pane of glass or a doorway, and then after the person walked through it, decided, oh, no. No, that's what it looks like, but that's just editing. No, or that's, uh, that's luck. Okay. <laughs> it really saw the, it thought the whole hallway was open, saw that half the hallway was obstructed, was churning on building a new path. Somebody came, so it stopped again, churned on building a new path, tried to go forward, and then found the doorway clear and went through. Okay. Uh, but I'm being honest, as yeah, no, opposed to telling that. you. <laughs> so it, it, you know, we had some advanced AI that saw the fruit. No, it's not what happened. No, it, uh, it was just kind of stuck in a thinking loop when it got blocked by half the doorway. And then yeah. the person came in, blocked it again. So it's, still the timing just worked out. Yeah. yeah. The timing worked out to make it look more impressive. Than, uh, others, I think it's actually still very impressive. Yeah, actually, based on what you just said, it, it, it did exactly that. I mean, it saw that the hallway was the door was blocked by the person. So it waited. Yeah. Because it was computing a new path. Yeah. And then it realized that it wasn't blocked and computed another path and then went through. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it, it does that. It yeah, does that, that was what it was really doing. So what are you talking about? It, no, I mean, it kind of, with, when you see it, the timing kind of makes it look like it sees the person's coming down the hall and it's patiently waiting. Oh, I see. It actually gets hung up the first time on half of on the, the half hallway. On the half doorway. Being, yeah, uh, and so it's like, oh, and then it looks like it's waiting for that person to come. It's not. It's, it's not that like, polite. Yeah. It's just that polite. <laughs> it was just luck. Yeah, yeah, it actually took a few oh, seconds. Yeah. At this time, now it does not, but at this time it took a few seconds to recompute its path every time. Now it's kind of it's got a multi-threaded approach where it's kind of can compute the path faster and, and more frequently. Did any of this end up in the products that uh, BrainCorp works on, as far as like the self-navigating floor scrubbers? N not that I'm aware of. Because I heard they were funded from Qualcomm or somehow. That's true. Yeah, in fact, back when we were talking about the biologically and spiral neural networks, that was actually in partnership with BrainCorp. But that was five years ago, probably, okay. in that realm, uh, in that area. Five years, no, 
I think I just saw a press release that they're using the NVIDIA Jetson TX2. Or oh, is they're not using the Qualcomm robot. chips anymore? No. That's well, I don't know. I mean, it's hard for me to speak <laughs> articul or concisely on it, but the press release I saw said they had chosen NVIDIA. Oh, thanks. Um, and they use the learning approach, which is probably going to use NVIDIA. Yeah. I think that's true. Um, Okay. So, yeah, I, I, I don't want to be careful not to project any further. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, in, in effect, it's very similar. It does seem similar. Yeah, similar it's, it's similar concepts. And, yeah, and so Arbus is the tool that everybody uses to render this stuff. So a lot of things actually uh, look similar because mm -hmm. <laughs> they're all being used and everybody's dumping their data to the same tool and so like if you look at Skydio they've got these really great autonomous drone videos they've got all these the same is because it's still using Arvis to go render it and so mm -hmm. <laughs> it all, and everybody's like oh is that this no it's not the same but they're using the same tools to, to display the information gotcha. so this now is what we showed at CES in January of 2017. And this was, the idea here was to show aggressive flight maneuvers. Actually, this was the exact wrong, uh, different, different uh, CPU. But this physical drone is the exact thing that's flying here. And the, uh, the idea was to show aggressive flight maneuvers um, precise location, localization while doing aggressive flight maneuvers, running concurrently with deep learning, in live in real time in, in, in a swarm. Here, this was running three vehicles uh, doing the exact same pattern. This is the first person view coming out of the vehicle. So this was actually what was taken from the camera on this. And you can see it's following this drone here, which is, this is my favorite. Thing in the world where it recognizes other drones. It seems like it's truly becoming sentient. It can recognize its own kind. And <laughs> the, so, but it can recognize ladders and pallets and people and uh, people. And is, it, is it doing that recognition on board the drone or is it sending the images back to a... Everything was done on board. Wow. Yeah, 100% hmm. of it was done on board. So it was doing all that, the flight, the localization, everything concurrently with deep learning. And the deep learning was running, I think, 13 frames per second while, you know, sending the video, capturing the video. And here, some point soon, it's going to turn up to about seven meters per second. So it starts at like three meters per second here as it makes a turn, jumps up to about seven meters per second. And this gets really great. At CES, it was just super impressive because there'd be a hundred people lined up set, uh, set the booth and it would just go, like paint the whole thing, person, 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 all the way around. Nice. You know, it'd show like 50 people like painted across. It was really... It was really impressive. Now, was it trained to recognize a subset of objects, or is that a more general purpose recognize anything? And so it was a general purpose recognize anything algorithm that was trained specifically to recognize these targets. These targets. Yeah, so and it comes training in. Training was done offline. Offline, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It didn't seem to recognize or, or care about the 2D barcode, the QR code on the floor? So it was the localization to it was flying using our localization technology, but to get a global positioning, so all the vehicles had knew where they were relative to each other, we used a, a fiducial marker inside of the arena. And then to hold ourselves honest, what we actually did was turn the lights white every time it saw it, so that you could kind of talk through the fact that, um, you know, you, you could kind of highlight that it, it wasn't using it all the time. It was flying via, dead reckoning or visual assisted dead reckoning mm -hmm. for most of it, but when it passed over, it would relocalize against that target. Was, so, there, uh, was, oh, sorry. was there a separate camera facing straight down that would look for the QR code? Yeah, yeah, this camera here, which is the same camera that does the visual odometry, this camera would also recognize the April tags. So the, the camera that's feeding this video doesn't care about the QR code. That's right, and that's maybe why it just doesn't show up there either. Okay. But yeah, it, that's right. The high res camera did not okay. uh, look at that. Is the leading drone being piloted by somebody or? No, everything was fully aut everything was uh, autonomous. Okay. So it's been given like waypoints. That's it's right. Told to go. Exactly. 
but this was fun. We ended up doing it at the Kino with the CEO and and the whole bit. So that was uh, that was that was a really fun effort. So let's see. So here's the team as it stands. Uh, there's now six of us. There's actually six and a half of us. There's somebody who's working part time as well. For the uh, the Qualcomm folks, you probably recognize most of them. In fact, you probably recognize all of them. You should. <laughs> they they all worked on the the project at one time or another. Where's Where's your office? We are in Miramar, over right by all of the microbreweries. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just coincidence. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we're just over in Miramar. And I, I can try, and, if we can turn on the light in here. You mind if I, you mind if I turn yeah, on the lights in here? Fine. Actually, this is a good demo area if you guys want to, I can see if I can fly the drone behind the window. Yeah. You just want to see a demo? Okay. Let's see if, uh, certainly for the, the, the ex Atlantic guys. Let's see. Yeah. Flying with our visual inertial odometry, Gary up there is one of the main. Oops, oh, control it, but Gary was the first heavily involved in that. Um, and it's using the, the channel assisted odometry system to inform the flight controller's position. So this thing is tracking. Uh, Keeping and saying what its current location is and trying to hold it, you know, because I'm hands off, it's trying to hold it in a very specific position. Now, we'll see, this is also configured to do visual obstacle avoidance. We'll have to see if there's a white wall, but I'll try and get it to, oops, let's see, let's see if it'll pick up anything. Oh, yeah, there it is. So the lights turn red when it detects an obstacle. I'm pushing the sticks forward. Oop, there, I lost it, but here we go, a little bit lower. Yeah, so I can go left and right, but I can't go forward. What's that? Uh, we'll see if it picks that up. It's probably, yeah, it picks that up. It probably picks up the blinds too, for that matter. But the plain white walls, let's we'll see if it'll do the blind. Yeah, we got the blind. But it's the white walls, it'll, let's see, it'll, yeah, it'll fly right in there. Let's try the mirror, or the, uh, the glass. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it's probably going to be a little bit. So you can kind of see the limitations of uh, deference here. Actually, it kind of falls into a blind spot at some point. So it's using the camera's, you know, the field, the field of view of the camera. You can only measure depth where the field of views overlap. So there's, there is a blind spot up front. And it also tends to be very noisy as you get up close as well. So the sweet spot's about one meter away. It can detect, in this configuration, it can detect pretty well between one and eight meters. But it, this highlights a little bit of what we're trying to do with, in our, in our Vostel cam, we want to have an active kind of flight sensor that would detect white walls. Now that one, there's all sorts of trade-offs. There's no perfect, there's nothing perfect right now. The, the active sensor that we use doesn't work well outdoors. So, the, but the stereo camera do work very well outdoors. And it also so happens there's not many plain white walls outdoors. 
plain white walls are very prevalent indoors, where the active sensors work better anyway. And so that that's pretty good. But there's uh, there's no you know we talk about millimeter we're talking about millimeter wave radar today. That would be a good one. There's all you know you want to keep. It. Yeah, so the time of flight sensors are actually time of laser pulse. Uh, that's very similar to time of flight. It's a different technique, but it has the same kind of trade-off, typically. Not I would argue one better than the other. Each of them, but they're not you know, conceptually, in terms of what they actually do, end up being very, very similar. That's right. Yeah, because they, they end up getting washed up in the sun. This is what happened. So, so that's it. That's what I have for today. Thank you. So, are you taking questions now? Of course, yeah. So, I have a question. Let me just turn this off. Okay. Well, we're always interested in new, uh, and new applications. New applications. Are you going to explain what it is? Are you going to everybody? Nope, it's going to solve it. I'll go look online. Right it's now. it's basically the idea is that all, there are existing open source technologies like five technologies that if you put them together, you can make a drone that goes and kills specific people very nicely. So you can do facial oh. facial recognition, obstacle avoidance, low cost, single shot mine. Um, and the, the video shows a drone, you know, a little bit smaller than that that flies up, recognizes a particular individual and goes in. H have you seen the drone that lands on walls? Yeah. Okay. So it uses that to land on the guy's forehead. Oh. At, at which point the shell, the shell goes <laughs> All right. Well, now we're stretching a little yeah. bit. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, so like I part. said, I hate yeah. to be that guy. Yeah. But <laughs> well, that, I mean. You how, can, how do you keep it from being used for evil and just about, I mean, yeah, I, you know, there's, there's no great answer to that. Other, I mean, I mean, you know, with every bomb these days has a, a cell phone strap to it. Does that mean this is a, you know, right. a bomb, you know, is this, is Google Pixel a bomb manufacturer? I don't, you know, it, it's very, uh. Uh, just so you know, I totally agree with you. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to say. I, I'm just kind of surprised that nobody's asked you that question before or pointed that out because that's exactly the, the technology demonstrator for, for what they were showing. They were yeah, but, but a lot of what they were doing isn't possible today. I mean, they, they, had, they had absolute position and perfect right. targeting. Yeah. Right. It's it's awesome. right. Yeah. Not Be nice yeah. to DJI. That's yeah. the more. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. I have a couple questions. So, uh, after I listen to this presentation, what are you guys trying to focus on? Software, power, the parts, the sensor, or you try to focus on integration? Integration of all of that. It's a, yeah, we look at it as a systems effort. I, I think of, uh, I think of what the approach we take is open sophistication, where this stuff is super, super hard to put together and build. To replicate this, and so we want to build a platform that is as open as possible. But you know, at this level of sophistication, it's super challenging to copy. But so we want to gain more customers by having it open than we lose by having it open, if that makes sense. And we know how hard it is. I mean, we struggled getting big time companies at Qualcomm onto a platform this sophisticated. So I'm not terribly concerned that others are just going to be able to rip it off, um, but it's a it's a full system. It's hardware and software. The software works with the hardware. It's designed for the hardware. The hardware is designed around the core components, and the whole thing is thought through. Uh, that drone that we demonstrated that we're designing for a, for a third party drone manufacturer. I mean, every bit's thought through, and then if we move this into that autopilot for the, the Voxel Plus autopilot for the 
the, the DOD effort, every single bit of it's thought through, you know, from how you're going to integrate with it, um, how people are going to use it, what other components is it compatible with, that's a big thing, so like what kind of ecosystem can you drop into, how do you make this thing compatible with other things that are out there so you don't have to reinvent every step of the way, because what I just described, you, so far we, we've kind of had to reinvent everything along the way, but that's not like a great approach from a broad platform perspective, but just even that part of it's hard, even just, just getting compatible components with it's a challenge, and that's not even that sophisticated a technology. So the approach we want to take is make it open, make it usable, make it accessible, but you know, best in class and, and really top notch. And there's things out there that are good examples of this. One I really like is uh, TensorFlow. Are, you, are folks familiar with TensorFlow, which is like the, yeah, so this is the deep learning framework that Google open sources. And that's very, very sophisticated and very capable and completely open source. And it's like, nobody's going to reinvent TensorFlow. <laughs> it's like, well, I mean, folks try, but in a different angle. It's not, it's very hard to just lever, you know, lift something like that as a, as a, a you know, I'm going I'm to come up with some version of it. it. It's very challenging and then go make a business out of it or be competitive with it. So, so. We look at ourselves as yeah, systems, robotic systems integrators with uh, our specialty leveraging mobile, the mobile ecosystem. So the same components that are on a smartphone, building uh, sophisticated, small, integrated robotic systems out of those components. Okay, and uh, since you already mentioned Grandcore, Shio, uh, Skyview, and I, I know there's another company here called Shio AI. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so what's your advantage of this company that you can compete with those people? So it comes back to, yeah, leveraging the mobile ecosystem. Uh, the, this pla the platform that we're demonstrating, the platform that we're doing all this is much smaller, cheaper, lighter, and just as capable as all those platforms. So it's, it's uh, yeah, this is, uh, I mean, I don't, This would stand stand out as being smaller and cheaper okay. than most systems. And yeah, you guys focus on only drones application. That wasn't our intention. You know, you know, when leaving Qualcomm, we kind of thought, oh well, maybe we've done all there is to do in drones, and the next opportunities are in household robotics. That seemed to be a big focus inside of Qualcomm and wanted to, well, we thought maybe that's what we'd follow. That would be the kind of market we would tackle. But as we got out, all the business, not, is all, I have to go through, we've got almost, we have four customers under contract, almost a fifth. I think everything's drawn. <laughs> and so we, it's huge. It, 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 everybody's getting into it. It doesn't, it's not portrayed that way in the media, but I think, I think we've crested this wave of the initial part of the hype cycle really around flying cameras. And I think DJI's made incredible products, but now the market's realized, well, we're not gonna compete with DJI. They've kind of conceded. They said, oh, DJI can have the flying camera market. We're gonna go after all of the, you know, making them useful. And, and there's just tons of opportunities out there where people are doing real world applications that will be coming online in the next year or two that you will see and get a benefit of and will be very tangible and it won't be far out there science fiction, it's gonna be right there. And, and uh, that's, where, that's where we have found the biggest source of opportunity in the last six months. Can I ask you a big question after okay. my last one? Um, you were talking about OpenCV integration during your presentation, that you had that on the... Yeah, one. yeah. But obviously the recognition thing, that's more like TensorFlow or something like that. That one there was Qualcomm's internal one that we showed, yeah. which was uh, the SNPE, or Snapdragon Neural Processing Engine. Uh, we've been doing, we've been using YOLO recently, which is another one that's very portable. It's like 20 C files, and it's very easy to compile. So we have OpenCV integration on our robot arm, and to be honest with you, we didn't having a hard time trying to find applications for it. 
I was just curious if you guys had come up with anything to actually use Open CV for, but like oh. doing with Open CV. Uh, all of it. Okay. <laughs> that would be a, a lot. Uh, Any um, examples? Well, feature extraction uh, for for tracking uh, the um, trying to just any kind of simple image manipulation. The so using it like a tool, like to to get down to a grayscale or to do that. Edge that's a, a, the base part of it. Yeah, the that's yeah, sort of thing. the enablers inside of it. I mean, we don't. It's all just it's built into much of the stuff we do. Uh, is, is leveraging open CV. Yeah, it seems like it's kind of a, it's like the, the Swiss Army knife that other yeah. things t tend to depend on and then use. That's right. It's not a, it's not an application that you in it's just on its own. Right. Uh, for actually, to, 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 to calibrate these stereo cameras, we, we use open CV uh, directly. Um, I was just curious if you've done anything with OCR or that we have not. Lying around looking for signs or something like that? No, not really. Not really. Uh, no. From a camera calibration would be the big one that we use a lot of open CV for, which is a big part of the, the toolbox. Cool. Yeah. Uh, do, do you have a price target for the voxel board? Oh, or? yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> I do, yeah, um, is this recorded? So no. Um, I, we're targeting sub five hundred bucks or five hundred bucks, but depending on where, you, you don't know until you actually run through it. But that's that's what our target is. And then it depends to, you know, is does every cable incur a new charge on top of it and those sorts of things. But. We, I mean, we think it's very interesting if you've got that full box on cam at five hundred dollars. Um, you know, it's still expensive, but it kind of back to the GoPro analogy. You know, if you think about where the early GoPros were, kind of around there, that's that's the idea and the goal is to take that concept and apply it to robotics. Just for you. and you know, for drones especially, GoPro was like this big enabler for, for the drone ecosystem. The first DJI drones just had mounts for GoPros and a lot of drones never made it past just having a mount for a GoPro on there. A lot of companies. So, <clears throat> so is that a sales point for you? Is the, the idea that other manufacturers for their drone, they'll just provide a compatible dock for your system? That is part of the vision. I don't know how, I, I think part of what we can bring would be we, we would help folks take that on, customize it specifically for their platform as well. To replace the controller that would otherwise want. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of, I don't know that everybody would actually want that black thing sticking off the front of their drone. <laughs> but like, but that concept where, you know, for prototyping, small business accessibility and prototyping, you could, a lot of things could. Now, as you get into more of a, targeting a consumer product or a finished application, you would want customization. We could help folks with that as well. Either license the reference design or, um, or, or actually do it for them as a service. Or That's what we're doing now mostly is that service, you know, helping people get that design. And license their ability to, to keep some of their additional stuff closed source or yeah. whatever in yeah. line with your own And it's system. ready for folks to build their own applications on top of as well. How adaptable is for Voxel to be underwater? How viable is it? Yeah. I guess it would kind of go back to the GoPro thing. <laughs> you need some kind of waterproof well, case. Would it? Would the algorithm work underwater? Oh, boy! You know that ha that's a, There's a lot of work going on there. It's not. So, I don't know anything about it. Uh, honestly, I've never done anything with underwater computer vision, and I just don't know. People are doing it though. People are doing something underwater. But I, I don't know enough about those algorithms to be able to tell you. But it would be cool to find out. But yeah. Currently, you're pretty heavily tied to Qualcomm and their parts. Um, have you seen a need to go beyond that? Well, so there's a couple of different ways to answer. So, 
There's a couple of different ways. One, we have a huge running start with what we did at Qualcomm. We know it inside and out. It was kind of ready to go when we left, and so now we're trying to capitalize on that. The um, Another way to look at it is, as long as Qualcomm's a good partner, we would continue to evolve on that path with newer chips and those sorts of things. And, and the fundamental reason why we still think, it, we think it's a good path with the running start, and they've been a very good partner, is it does have very significant competitive advantage. There's nothing that gets stuff that small in this space still. It, it's, uh, if you move to an I, you know, an NXP part, you lose all sorts of stuff. You lose an ISP, or you lose the GPU, or you lose a significant GPU, or you lose the ability to offload a lot of prompt, or do a lot of processing on board, um, you know, integrated Wi-Fi, or those sorts of things. So, yeah, it provides the smallest form factor with the most capability today. So, it's kind of hard. If, since we're in that ecosystem already, it would be pretty hard to move off. The NVIDIA, uh, NVIDIA would have the best competition, but in a different way. It's very, very powerful, but, but the, the heat sink weighs as much as half of this drone. You know, and <coughs> for aerial applications, weight is, is all of it. It's, it's all that matters is your weight. So, so and I know Skydio uses NVIDIA that, uh, and, but it's a much, and they do a lot of really cool stuff. They have incredible algorithms, but you know, it's a much, much bigger vehicle. So, you know, that, that's the trade off. But we're not obligated to use Snapdragon. Uh, but right now, it's the best shot we have at success. Thank you very much, Chad. If we can give a round of applause to.